Okay, so they're only opening up the app for 24 seconds. How do we make those the most productive 24 seconds? We have been talking about 0 to 1, 1 to n, etc. Right? Let's talk about probably like minus 1 to 0. Like all of us get enamored with the shiny thing. We can get enamored with the new technology, right? But ultimately, how do you build that business is, is the key thing. What are some of the early signs that these founders can see uh, early in the game to make sure their product can be implemented in reality and how they can course what is the defensible moat that you're going to be building as you go along this trajectory for anybody who's like maybe building a startup right this could be some things which they can consider while reaching out to other people for ad advice and all of that stuff right hey everyone welcome to our uh, podcast everything product in this podcast we talk about uh, product management concepts and technology insights. Today we have a very special treat uh, for all the product aspirants out there. Uh, we have a special uh, guest uh, and we're honored to invite uh, Mr. James to our podcast, uh, who is a visionary in product space and shaped the landscape across various uh, industries such as uh, Microsoft and uh, Slack as a director of product and also who led as a chief product officer at uh, spend desk which was valued at over one billion dollars which was amazing and also who is currently uh, an advisor to both uh, berkeley at uh, in berkeley in incubator as well as um, um, an advisor to a startup called coho ai uh, which is amazing so first james uh, thank you for taking your time in your busy schedule and making it available for us thank you Srinath. absolute pleasure awesome so maybe before going into all the, I mean, topics, I know you will be sharing amazing insights on different spaces. Maybe we'll start with an icebreaker, right? So if you would like to give an advice to yourself 20 years ago, what would that piece of advice be? I think, so I, I think uh, the advice that I would give myself beginning of my career, coming out of school, two things. Um, the first one is um, there's a lot of temptation as an aspiring engineer, as an aspiring product manager to come out of university and you've got that sparkle in your eye of wanting to and an idea of starting your own company. Um, my advice would be to hold off on that for a little bit longer um, and go into a larger, more established company whether it be one of the companies that, that you guys are at or whether it be, you know, Microsoft and Amazon and Apple or Google. And the main reason there is to really start to understand and build out the core competencies and the skill sets that you need. It's also going to be really helpful and really important for you to build out your network, whether it's on the product, the design or the engineering side. So when you do have that sparkle in your eye and you do want to go out there and start your own company, you've got that network to lean against or to get help in actually building the company that you're going after. Um, and as you can tell, I'm, I'm not from originally from Silicon Valley, um, but now, now I live in here, here and I've, I've lived here for quite some time. The other piece of advice is, I would say, get to Silicon Valley as quickly as possible. There's so much going on here. I know you guys lived elsewhere. <laughs> um, don't want to deprecate that, but there's just so much going on here. I came here um, a little later in my career and I would say, skip that bit and go right, go right to Silicon Valley. Funny is already there. <laughs> He's just a few miles away from there. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we have something to catch up there. Uh, yeah, no, that's a, I mean, that's an amazing piece of advice for all the, I mean, aspirants out there, right? I mean, we need to think that uh, end to end. And um, one of the things which I was really amazed, especially your uh, expertise and your various feedback on the startup spaces, how people should think about responsible AI, how should they think about as they scale their products. I was really amazed to see your advice to various startup founders during that conference, I think, which was very insightful for me as well. So uh, maybe uh, a question uh, to get started on that, right? So my first question is, especially when working on startups, when leading startups, the way product managers should think or approach is way different, right? Versus managing a scale-up. Uh, how should a PM uh, from a startup world uh, should think differently? I was just curious to get your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been lucky to 
lead teams at various different scales, <clears throat> whether at Microsoft, Slack, or at Spendesk, or earlier stage startups as well. And essentially, the, the big difference is with a, an early stage startup, you're still trying to find product market fit. And so you're a tight, a tight integrated team. And what you want to be doing is iterating really, really quickly, gathering hypotheses, going out and testing those hypotheses with various different uh, forms of, of prototyping, whether it be, you know, Figma, paper or code itself, iterating really, really quickly, instrumenting your application as much as possible, understanding the funnel, understanding how you're doing demand generation, understanding how uh, you're acquiring customers and converting customers or converting users. But it's a very, very tight team that you're, you're moving around the, the surface area of your product, if you will, constantly learning, constantly um, adding to the product and moving the ball forward. And as a product leader, you're, you're really there to help that team understand the space and the problem space that they're trying to solve for. You're really the one of the key um, voices of the customer. You're kind of the expert on the problem, not necessarily the solution, but the expert on the problem. You've got that visceral sense of the context of the user. And so as your engineering lead or as your design lead comes to you and says, okay, this is what I'm thinking of doing, or can you tell me more about this problem? You intuitively understand, okay, this persona, this is how they walk through the world. And therefore, given what you're presenting, this is how they'll react and this is how they'll respond or this is how they'll use the product, right? So you are that subject matter expert in that sense, this very tightly knit, uh, knit team as you're moving towards getting product market fit. Now, when you into in a scale-up, as you switch over to a scale-up, that means you've got your product market fit. You've got a lot of indices and KPIs are going up to the right. Everything's great from that perspective. And a product leader, then you need to switch from, at the chief product officer level anyway, from building the product to building the company. And that's a significant mindset shift. You're building the organization. And so how you, you organize your teams, how you organize your squads, um, building in more processes. That process gets a, a bad rap. It doesn't mean bureaucracy. It just means predictability in how you're going to do things so more people can plug into that process, right? How do you better integrate with product marketing? How do you better integrate with sales and the go-to-market motion as a whole? So again, Basically, what you've got at the startup phase is the single tight team that's moving around the problem space, getting product market fit, iterating really quickly. And then when you're scaling up, it's how do you build out both from an organizational and an infrastructure and a product perspective, scalable process and scalable organizations, because you're now building the company. Yeah, I know. I, I kind of resonate with that, um, right? Like you have, you are basically the master of the problem rather than solution. You know, you're very closer to the problem, right? And so, you know, if you were to say, right, if if a product manager is starting on, you know, as a product person on the startup and on the scale side, right? What are the two important things which they have to concentrate on building a product? Like, is it on the startup side, is it, do you think, is it, I, I, you know, you have covered some of this, like velocity or something like that, but if you were to point, like, these are the two main things you focus on, what would they be? Yeah, the, the first one is, is really focus like a laser beam on, on, the, on the one problem you're looking to solve, right? And there are two things about that problem that's very, the, that's very important. The, the first one is, and it's it's an age old uh, axiom. Are you building a a vitamin or a painkiller, right? And you really want to be the, what you're building is the painkiller, right? It's something that is really going to solve a core problem that the end user has. So focus like a laser beam on that one problem and make sure that you're building a painkiller rather than a vitamin, which is making things a little bit better, right? which isn't going to be a compelling value proposition for your end user, your customer. So, so that's, that's the, the, uh, the first thing. And then once you have a uh, focus like a laser beam on that, you want to be, like I say, iterating really, really quickly to ensure that you're solving that problem as quickly and easily and effectively as possible. It's all about prioritization. Um, and the second part of your question, Sid, what was that? 
uh, what would the same to be when it's a more scaled up uh, uh, product or an yeah, when you're going to scale up there. So before you're probably looking at um, monthly active users, daily active users, engaged users, etc. When you're switching into a scale up, that's when you really start moving into understanding and and driving progress through unit economics. Again, that's from where you're building a product which people are going to be using that later on you want to monetize. But as you switch into a scale-up, that's where you focus on building the company and building the business. So as a chief product officer, you're looking at unit economics such as customer acquisition costs or CAC payback, right? And there you're starting to balance the cost of delivering a product and the value and the price you can actually get for the product and the time it takes to actually get from revenue paying back the costs of actually acquiring an individual customer. You're starting to think about efficiency in your go-to-market strategy and execution. You're really looking at, but I'll, I'll leave it there because you said two. So it's like, okay, unity economics would be my focus. And then it is how you're streamlining your go-to-market execution. For, I, I, I love that thought process that you provided there, James. So I feel like all three of us are in that phase where we are transitioning from being a product manager, product focused on how we build the products or scale the products to a place where we need to think about building teams and building the uh, organizations. Uh, can you give us some suggestions on like, how do we make the transition? How do we make that mind shift? I mean, okay, taking a step back, what's the point in time when you need to make that time, that shift, right? So um, how do you establish that you've got product market fit? And you can you can start um, focusing your energies elsewhere. And a lot of people, they will say, well, we've got an NPS score of 50. We've got product market fit. That, that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't do it for me. What you what you've really got when you've got product market fit is when you're getting pulled into usage, you've got demand coming from the market. You're not having to as much drive into the market and and convince people to actually use your products. You've actually got people pulling you in to their workflows, pulling you in. And that's something you'll recognize as as you've got your various different metrics are going up and to the right, but people are also paying, right? Mm. Um, All of my business has been subscription-based business, not ad-based business. Um, that's just because it lines up with my values. I like to build value and then deliver that value and then charge for that value rather than monetize users. Um, and so when people are paying for your product, then you've got product market fit. So then you make that transition. What you need to be thinking of is what does my team, what does my organization need to make that transition? Because you've got to start layering in these things over time. So do they need a product strategy? Do they need the roadmap? Um, As as you develop from a startup into a scale-up, you could be in a situation where silos have started to develop, where EPD, engineering, product, and design have been more focused on the product, and they've kind of got decoupled from the sales organization or decoupled from the marketing organization. The commercial organization has been very focused on selling, right? So you'll, you'll get this you'll have this intuition, you have this feeling that you're not as connected as you used to be, right? And, you, and you'll hear that from different people as well. Like sales organization will be like, we don't understand the roadmap and how we're actually, what, what are we delivering to our customers, you know, two quarters or over the next 12 months? You'll start hearing those types of signals. That's when you think to yourself, aha, okay, this is when we need to take a bit of a step back and you need to circle with the rest of your peer group from these different organizations, whether it's from sales, customer success, marketing, et cetera, and say, okay, we need to up-level our game in terms of cross-functional organization. And look at the major problems that you're currently having. Is it as you're launching products, you're having challenges there where your, your product launches aren't as effective or as impactful? And said, okay, let's, let's marry up our product release or our feature release with our go-to-market execution. Let's focus there. Um, are, are our sales folks, are they, do they not have a good sense of what is being delivered in the roadmap so that they can help alleviate technical and business objections from customers by talking about what's going to be coming next? 
what they can be excited about, what they can anticipate coming so they can move uh, a sale forward, right? So it's really understanding intuitively um, how the organization is working together across the entire company and using these signals because a PM, um, along with another, a number of other ones, you're really the glue across a lot of these different organizations. As a PM, you can start layering in the processes, the one-on-ones, the team huddles, the Slack uh, channels, etc., to help focus everybody on solving the short-term problems. But the one thing that you really shouldn't do is try to solve everything all at once. <laughs> right. So as you're going from startup to scale up, a lot of things will be will be broken. And it's fine because they were broken for really good reasons. But now it's like, okay, now we need to start fixing some of these things. And you can't really fix everything all at once because people will get overwhelmed through change. So you want to be very, very focused. Building a building a company, building a product is, as I like to say, you're dr- you're you're building the car as you're driving down the freeway. Right. Mm-hmm. So make sure that you've got four wheels. And then once you've got those four <laughs> wheels going, then it's like, okay, what do we need to do next as you're driving down 101 at 85 miles an hour, right? That, that's really the metaphor to keep in mind. Yeah, I also, uh, you know, have another metaphor like they say that you're jumping off the cliff and then you start building a plane. Building the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Something yeah. similar to it. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't, yeah, if it doesn't go well, I don't know. I don't like where that metaphor ends. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of, I think, folks, especially the startup founders get stuck there. They probably know how to get from zero to one, but they don't know how exactly seamlessly to scale from one to N. Um, So I was just curious from your experience, I know you worked in various leading organizations, any good lessons or um, uh, like examples that you could share uh, that would be helpful for the viewers? Yeah, uh, lots of things. So for example... Um, Maybe one example I should be fine. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, you have one example. Just kidding. So, so um, when I I was very very lucky to be um, recruited into Microsoft just after um, a company called Accompli had been acquired into Microsoft, and uh, there were three founders, um, incredible individuals, extremely successful serial entrepreneurs, very uh, successful people. They they recognized that. Um, to integrate into Microsoft, they need to be operating more strategically. And so they needed a a product leader to come in and help the team, which was relatively small, in getting to that next level. Um, And the first thing that you need to do is really diagnose the situation. So sitting down with your engineering leads, sitting down with your design leads, and really having that almost servant leadership type of approach, like, okay, what is working well? What could be working better? The old classic question is, if you had a magic wand, what would you change today? Um, And it could be everything's working working great, um, or it could be things like, well, we need to be operating better as a team. We've got challenges with tech debt. Um, We need to be better communicating out to the field organization so they know what's going to be coming next so we can focus on building what is next rather than constantly having uh, dealing with inbound. So yeah, so the first thing you want to do is really sit down with your peers and and really get to understand their context, what they need to be successful. Because when all said and done, within a company, there's writing code and there's selling code. And those are really yeah. the only two feet functions that are truly, truly fundamental and important. And as product managers, we don't do either of those, right? Yeah. We're in the middle trying to make sure that they can write good code and they can sell good code. And so really having that servant leadership mentality would be really, really helpful as you're stepping into a, into a startup, going into a scale-up or joining a new team. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and maybe, right, like one other question, I think a lot of founders and also new product managers struggle is, right, when do I know I got to product market fit, right? So there's like a lot of different definitions. And some people say that you you know when you get to that place. <laughs> and uh, we have also seen a lot of startups take some, sometimes they might take two years, five years, or, you know, even more to get to that spot, right? Like, like maybe can you share some examples of uh, uh, in the previous organizations which you worked, right? Like, when did you know that you hit product market fit and that's the time to scale up to the next level? 
Yeah. So um, let, let's first of all, um, what product market fit is, is kind of like a, a lagging indicator, right? Um, it, it seems like the way that you're describing it, Sid, there's more of a, an art than a science. So the, the first thing is <laughs> trying to turn it into more of a science, try to find that metric that you can, um, uh, you can, you can use to say, okay, we're on the right path. So go back to first principles and look at John Doerr's and OKRs, ob objectives and key results. So the key result is we've got product market. The objective is we've got product market fit. The key result is what do we measure that by looking at that number, we can really say, yeah, we've got product market fit. And that could be um, the sales cycle, right? The sales cycle is, is short um, or it could be revenue. Um, it's definitely not $1. It's not the first sale. It's a number of sales, a repeatable number of sales where ultimately as an organization, as a company, you can say with a, a high degree of confidence that if we took $5 million and poured it in this end with demand generation, et cetera, we would get X number of dollars out of the other side, hopefully more than 5 million. And you've got that, that confidence and that predictability. Then you've really got product market fit. You understand your product. You understand the problem that it, that it serves. You understand your value. You understand what you're getting, what you're charging the customer for, and you understand the revenue that can be generated. That I think is a, is in my sense, product market fit. So let's, let's say ARR or MRR, monthly recurring revenue is your, is your product market fit. What you dial back to get there though, is a, is a, is a KPI, a key performance indicator that your triad can iterate on quickly to know that, okay, if we keep on doing this and keep on moving this needle, then we can actually uh, get to that, that ARR or that MRR number that we're looking at. And the way that we did that within, within Microsoft with Outlook Mobile is um, we were looking at the KPI that we were uh, marching towards was um, it started out because we didn't have a lot of instrumentation at the time. It was very high level. It started out monthly active users, but then we started to look at daily active users. Um, and then we started looking at uh, onboarding time. So what we recognized was, so a lot of people will think that if I just add this one feature, we're going to get product market fit. Yep. The reality is, is that very rarely happens. We release one feature and all of a sudden it goes like that, unless it's, unless it's a mind blowing feature, right? That's right? Usually what it ends up being is, is really more rudimentary and fundamental. It's on your onboarding funnel, right? So looking at your onboarding funnel, you sign, sign up and sign in. How do you remove the friction and the broken glass to ensure that people are getting onto your product first, recognizing that value? Once they recognize that value, then you can monetize. So back at Slack, we did the same thing. So um, at Slack, we recognized that. So the pandemic opened up and Slack was um, heavily in demand because it enabled teams to come together, regardless of the industry, to have that human connection, to be productive, to, to be able to collaborate. And seeing that demand, the biggest challenge that we had was that front end of that experience. And so we had this day one program where all across the organization, all across the company, we were focusing on two things. First of all, it was stripping out, as, as Stuart Butterfield said, removing all of the broken glass from the onboarding flow, right? So we can smoothly get into the product. And then the second part is the day one experience, the day one journey. So somebody lands into Slack. What do they then do? Do they understand? Can they orient themselves? Can they get value out of the product? Then once you've got those two, then you're looking at like expansion and using PLG, product-led growth methodologies. So we get yep. Sid on board. How does Sid get Srinath on board? And how do we get Fanny on board? How do we make that easy using various different channels and mechanisms? And that, and that then once you start expanding, then you can start to monetize. So in the enterprise space or a sales-led growth model, you try and land and expand. Whereas in a PLG model, you expand and then land. Sure. Okay? And that's yeah. basically what we did in Microsoft with Outlook Mobile and with Slack. And we started doing that at Spendesk as well. 
Awesome. So you're essentially saying that you have an objective, which could be a definition of a product market fit, and you have a couple of KRs, which are, you start measuring. And maybe in the starting, it is very hard to move these numbers. But at some point, it, you know, you see a trend where these are numbers are moving faster. And, you know, that could be something where people are attracted towards and finding value and all of that stuff. And I, I think I I relate to some of these experiences, right? When you build a completely new product, you don't have the instrumentation and data collection all in place and yeah. monthly active users and, you know, daily active users are the way you measure stuff. And then at some point you figure out what the point of value is and that's what your measure of metric or, you know, the, the product market fit measure is. And you then rally towards that and, you know, increasing that as you go. Awesome. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and underneath all of that, so perfectly perfectly put there said yes yeah, as, you, as you're in a startup as you're joining a startup or you're starting a startup you don't have all the data that you need you don't have the instrumentation but you've still got to make progress right and so as a pm what you do is you you get close to your user you get close to your customer understand their context and from there you develop hypotheses so at outlook mobile very early on we're like okay so our goal was to get to 100 million monthly active users and intuitively, we kind of thought, okay, to do that, we've got to make it as easy. It's email. So we've got to make it as easy as possible to start writing emails. And so we started going down this path around uh, email creation. Then we started instrumenting the application and looking at the data, uh, we were seeing that a session length was 24 seconds long. The average session length for Outlook Mobile was 24 seconds long. And we're like, well, no one's writing War and Peace in 24 seconds. What on earth? What are they doing in 24 seconds? And it's like, ah, oh, okay. So what they're doing is they're, they're standing in line at, uh, at Starbucks. They're pulling out their phone. They're saying, okay, did I get an email from my boss? Did I get an email from my, uh, from my customer? No, I didn't. That's great. And putting it back in, right? And so what we had to do was flip 180 degrees and say, okay, this isn't an email creation. It's not a creative experience. It's a consumptive, it's a consumption experience. So all of a sudden our product strategy flipped 180 degrees and how we're thinking and how we're prioritizing and therefore what are our KPIs changed considerably. And the key thing there is once you, which is somewhat counterintuitive, it wasn't so much how do we get 24 seconds to 25 seconds to 26 seconds, you know, to 30 seconds and beyond? It's not, that's kind of putting your product at the center of, of the universe. What you really want to do is put the user at the center of the universe. And say, okay, so they're only opening up the app for 24 seconds. How do we make those the most productive 24 seconds that that user is ever going to have, right? And so that influences your entire information architecture, Absolutely everything about the problems that you're solving, right? Simplification, simplification becomes the goal is then to become more elegant on a mobile platform, not to jam more features in. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you mentioned about the customer friction, the onboarding and all, and that really matters for any subscription kind of businesses, right? Like, I mean, you may build uh, like so many features after, like who may access after sub subscription but first you need to get them to subscribe to your application if not then how do you go even let them use that so we if I, I mean when i was in amazon uh, we're building new payment products we were primarily initially focusing on the building new product features like consolidation invoicing that kind of stuff but which is good but our meantime to onboard the customer into our payments platforms the customer friction rates the dropout rates were so high yeah that, okay we took a hold let's go and solve that first before we start building features so i was resonating that no, absolutely absolutely um it, it's as, as as product people we get enamored by the next shiny thing whether it's a, a, a technology or a problem that needs to get solved and and every product person wants to build that next tiny shiny thing um, but often what I, what I was, was telling my team is like, okay, we can do that. But basically you're, you're building a house without any doors, <laughs> yep. right? You, you could have the most fantastic and fun party going on inside that house. But if you can't, if you have to break down a wall to get in there, it doesn't matter, yeah. right? Get a, get a really good door, have a wonderful welcome mat that's welcoming and inviting for people to come in, um, and then start 
focusing on the experience once people are actually in that in that room or in that house. Hope you guys are enjoying this uh, session. Uh, we have split the session into two parts. Uh, the part two is going to come next Saturday. So please stay tuned there. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Everything Product.